Seeing the suffering caused by attachment to one's body is the initial insight that focuses the mind on tamma. Those who see the body clearly tend to understand tamma quickly. The corpse within. Walking back to the nunnery that evening, Machi Gao felt wondrously bright and buoyant in both body and mind. Reaching her small hut just as dusk fell, she seated herself in meditation as usual and comprehensively reviewed her meditation practice. Samadhi attainments had always come easily to Mechi Gao. Her mind tended naturally toward integration. Only a well-integrated mind could attain the kind of access concentration needed to directly experience the vast world of spiritual energies she encountered so readily. When her flow of consciousness converged to its natural center, it touched base with the true essence of mind, but only briefly, before rebounding out to resume its normal dynamics. That brief experience of mind essence led to a mistaken sense of certainty about the knowledge arising from her subsequent perceptions. Rather than using that calm and concentrated mental focus to examine those transient states of mind, Machi Gao passively watched her mind's changing panorama, letting her faculties of thought and imagination speculate on the meaning of what occurred there. Since the conclusions reached by conceptual thought are superficial and personal, she had lost touch with the detached awareness of the mind's essence, thereby falling victim to corrosive elements of consciousness that gave an emotional bias to her perceptions and led her astray from genuine understanding. Her conscious mind became so involved with its habitual fabrications that it appeared to have an independent existence from its original essence. Ajahn Mahabur's dramatic intervention changed that. Now, when her flow of consciousness converged to its natural center, it reunited with the mind's essence, completely merging into the wondrous nature of pure awareness and resting totally in supreme tranquility. Body and consciousness vanished. An indescribably subtle awareness was the only thing to remain. There was no movement, not even the slightest rippling of consciousness. Only after her mind remained immersed in tranquility for a sufficient time did it stir and begin to withdraw from the center. A brief ripple of consciousness occurred, and then quickly disappeared. The rippling happened naturally of its own accord. It was not intended. A slight movement, immediately followed by stillness. Conscious moments surfaced and vanished many times, gradually increasing in frequency until the flow of consciousness eventually re-established its normal momentum. Although she had regained awareness of her external environment, the conceptual faculties of her mind remained dormant. Her consciousness was suspended in a fluid and spontaneous state of awareness where the knowing nature of the essence continued to overrule the mind's normal thinking patterns. Due to this spontaneity, unbounded awareness and specific perception were functioning at the same time, allowing her to understand her mind and body at a deeply intuitive level of insight. She knew instinctively that she must hold her attention at that level when examining phenomena in order to attain the penetrative insights of true wisdom. Wisdom was able to function effectively within the normal flow of consciousness because her habitual thinking patterns no longer prevented access to deeper spontaneous knowledge gained through direct intuition by a more subtle faculty of knowing. Emerging from the deep tranquility of Samadhi late that night, Mechi Gao experienced the flow of her consciousness spreading out slowly through every part of her body until she perceived its entire form all at once. Preconceptions about the body did not intrude on her awareness. She simply concentrated on the form of her body as it actually was, in a sitting position. Her detached awareness knew intuitively that inherent within her bodily form was a process of continuous decay that eventually culminated in the body's death and disintegration. With a profound degree of mental clarity, she picked up the thread of her body's ongoing decay and began to follow that natural course to its inevitable conclusion. The process of decay started deep within the inner cavities of her body and slowly spread throughout every part. She simply observed without thinking or imagining and allowed her body's breakup to unfold within the field of her awareness. Soon the natural course of decay for a dead body assumed a spontaneous momentum all its own. 
Beginning at the head, Manchi Gao let her attention gradually filter down through the whole corpse, allowing the images of decay to become sharp and clear. Because her intuitive wisdom had become fully attuned to the notion of death and disintegration, spontaneous changes began occurring in the flowing imagery. She felt her inner corpse begin to swell and slowly change color, the skin turning yellow, then molting into bluish black. As the body swelled, the skin stretched taut, then ruptured and peeled back, revealing rotting flesh and oozing fluids that quickly attracted a swarm of flies. Gradually, the stench of rotting flesh became nauseating and nearly unbearable to her internal senses. The flies laid eggs and maggots appeared, spreading out and moving as a writhing mass in and around the ruptures of peeling skin and oozing flesh to eventually cover the whole corpse. By the time the maggots had eaten their fill of rotten tissue, most of the flesh and internal organs were gone. Without the connective tissue, the skeleton fell apart and slumped over in a pile, leaving a heap of filthy bones streaked with remnants of decaying flesh and bound together with twisted strands of tendon and cartilage. Further disintegration left the bones disjointed and scattered, the skeleton contorted. With the passage of time, rain, and weather, the residual bits of flesh and tendon were washed away, leaving only bones bleached milky white by the sun. Eventually the bones too began to break up and disintegrate, until only the larger chunks remained in a disordered heap, the skull in one place, the pelvis in another. Finally, even these pieces were worn away, swallowed up and reclaimed by the earth element from which they originated. Suddenly the earth itself vanished, leaving nothing but pure, crystal-clear awareness radiating out in all directions. Gradually the sense of being in the midst of radiant awareness disappeared, taking with it all sense of self and of the environment. Mei Gao meditated in that way every day. She focused on the corpse within over and over again until the experience of death and decay became habitual features of her mind's conscious perspective and the mental image of her body began to decompose every time she turned her attention to it. In each meditation sitting, Manchi Gao's inner eye watched the process of dissolution unfold with a deepening sense of calm and clarity. Gradually, the constant breakup of bodily substance drew her attention to the body's fragmentary nature, so she began concentrating on its constituent elements, the properties of earth, water, fire, and wind that comprise all matter. Flesh, bones, teeth, nails, and hair had the solid material characteristics of earth. Blood, urine, mucus, and other fluid secretions possessed the liquid qualities of water. Fire was present as warmth, energy, and vitality in the body. The wind element was evident in breathing, circulation, and bodily movement. Mei Gao observed how decay broke down the material bonds that hold elements together within the body, and how it released them to revert to their original elemental state. The occurrence of death, when consciousness abandoned the body for good, released the life-giving forces of fire and wind to return to their elemental conditions. Observing further from the inner perspective of spontaneous awareness, she watched as bodily liquids seeped into the ground or evaporated into the air. When the liquid elements had either drained into the ground or vanished into the air, the bodily parts dried out, gradually dehydrating until only hardened tissue and bare bones remained. Slowly crumbling and then turning to dust, those parts finally returned completely to the earth element. Mei Gao vividly observed bones merging with earth, the two coalescing together to become one and the same substance. When the last residue of bone returned to its original elemental state, her heart became absorbed in the profound realization of the body's insubstantial and illusory nature. Knowledge and understanding arose that all bodily substance is a combination of earth, water, fire, and wind and that they had all returned to their original elemental state. Suddenly, the earth itself disappeared from awareness, leaving her perception filled with bright light radiating in all directions. Then, in a flash, her awareness plunged to a level of integration she had never experienced before. With that, the radiant light vanished, 
an indescribable emptiness remained, a state of absolute oneness without a single moment of duality. There was only pure awareness, a transcendent and marvelous state of perfect tranquility, totally devoid of distinguishing characteristics, the vibrant emptiness of the mind's true essence. The elemental transformation of the body into earth, water, fire, and wind was vividly distinct every time Manchi Gao investigated it. She saw clearly that nothing dies. Hair, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, bones. Reduced to their original elemental form, they are simply the earth element. Since when did the earth element ever die? When they decomposed and disintegrated, what did they become? All bodily matter reverted to its original properties. The earth and water elements reclaimed their original properties, as did the wind and fire elements. Nothing was destroyed. Those elements simply came together to form a mass in which the conscious mind took up residence. The mind attached itself to the mass of matter and animated it, then carried it as a burden by building a self-identity around it. By laying personal claim to the physical body, the mind acquired endless amounts of pain and suffering. The mind never died either. At most there was constant change, birth and death arising and passing in every conscious moment, following one another in an endless continuum. The more fully Machi Gao investigated the four elements, observing them disintegrate into their original properties, the more distinctly pronounced the mind appeared. So where was death to be found? And what was it that died? The four elements, earth, water, fire, and wind, they did not die. As for the mind, how could it die? With this understanding, her mind became more conspicuous, more aware, and more insightful. Withdrawing from supreme tranquility, Mechi Gao contemplated the profound and far-reaching implications of physical embodiment. She realized that her sense of body was one domain of self-identity. From birth, she had always organized the world around bodily perceptions, being instinctively preoccupied with the protection of the body and the fulfillment of its material appetites. She clearly discerned that thoughts formed on the basis of the body were karmic causes keeping her continually bound to the cycle of birth and death. The body's innate impurity actually went much deeper than its physical form. It extended to many bodily-based attitudes and actions that were not only repulsive but very damaging. Vanity, sensual obsessions, sexual aggression, and physical violence were ugliness of a much more insidious type. Being responsible for such a large array of negative thoughts and emotions, identification with bodily form connected the mind to the root of samsaric existence. She realized that if she wanted to trace bodily attachment to its source, she would have to directly investigate those defiling thoughts and emotions and the flow of consciousness that spawned them.